Welcome to the MCAT Basics Podcast, brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach. Each week, Sam Smith breaks down high yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Welcome to a bonus episode of MCAT Basics. Today I'm joined by Alex Starks, who is the Associate Director of MCAT at Med School Coach. He's also a 99th percentile scorer and has been involved in creating a bunch of different MCAT products, including MCAT exams, um, MCAT workbooks, etc., as well as has tutored a bunch of different students. So Alex, uh, first of all, thanks a bunch for joining me. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Sam. So kind of the first question I, I have for you is I know you've been tutoring for, for quite a long time. How many people total do you think you've tutored? I actually keep uh, tabs on this because it's a, it's a nice number, and I just eclipsed 400 students. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's obviously a very lot of students. Um, w- what I wanted to kind of talk to you about today was just developing a study plan. I know this is kind of the first thing you do when you tutor students is you sit, is you sit down and you know, you develop this, this plan for somebody to study. And I think it's a super important part of that whole process. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on some different things here. Yeah, for sure. So first question I have for you is what do you recommend students do in terms of setting their test date? I know, you know, some will choose to, to set it right away. That way they have that goal kind of at the end of the road that they're studying for. That's what I did. And then I know other students who just don't set a test date. Um, so is there any recommendations you have there for students? Yeah, this is, can be kind of tricky, but I think uh, setting a test date with the understanding that, of course, if you're not ready by that test date, you need, you need to move it. Um, but set, te- set a test date early and try to stick to it because it's a lot of motivation and helps you stay accountable. But the realization for most people is that their initial test date is not going to be um, when they're ready. Right. And how, how many, like what percent of students does that happen to where they set a test date and then they end up pushing it a bit? What would you say? So that is a great question. And I would say for most of my students, they don't run into it that often simply because I have, am able to sort of program and forecast when they will be ready, but there are still, that still does happen. So I probably, if I had to throw out a number, probably about a quarter. A quarter. Okay. So in kind of your first sit down meeting with students, you know, what things are involved in creating a a study plan? I know there's like a study calendar, um, but what other kind of things like that do you sit down and go through with them? Yeah. So every student is a little bit different. Um, There are a few, a few things that everybody needs to be successful for the MCAT. And one is content. And so if a student needs to go through all of the content, because they haven't seen it in a couple of years, that's, you know, job one. So we, we program and set deadlines that are realistic uh, for all of that content to get, to get done. And then one of the other things that are as vital for uh, being ready for, for testing is a lot of practice, of course. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to do a ton of practice during the content review portion of a, of a study schedule. Just not the most efficient use of time. It's not the worst use of time, but not the most efficient. And then, of course, the most important thing is the double AMC practice tests that are in real conditions, timed, they're just like you'd see on test day. You're wearing your mask, all that kind of stuff. Um, so those are those are really the, the things that you need to plan out for your study schedule. Gotcha. And you kind of mentioned it there. Um, you know, what what exactly does a, a study schedule look like? So, so what you said was um, that part of the schedule, at least, is just content review. Now, is that kind of how you break it down with students? Is there a time to do, you know, just content, then a little bit of content and practice, and then maybe a third where you're doing more practice tests? Kind of what does that look like? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the what works for most people most often is to have a dedicated time for just reading through books, uh, supplementing with videos, um, and anything else that you you know you might need to, to get uh, weak areas stronger. And then during content, or sorry, during uh, the practice phase, you're still doing content and you really should be doing practice, one, to get the experience of uh, answering MCAT questions, but then also to show you where your own weaknesses are and, you know, kind of go and go and work on, on those and then do more practice questions on that topic to make sure that you actually learned it uh, properly. So, Sure. Now, 
one another thing you mentioned is that a lot of students kind of start out at different places. Um, and I know for myself too, I was studying engineering and I really didn't have probably as good of a grasp on some of the physiology concepts that I wish I would going in. Um, so with that said, how do stu- students kind of calculate how much time they're going to need to study for the MCAT? I think that's something that's um, definitely not easy to do. So what is some advice you have there? Yeah, this is the million dollar question. Um, and <laughs> I was in a similar boat. I was a math major. And when I was okay. setting out to study for the MCAT, the, my sciences were uh, abysmal, actually probably outside of physiology, you know, um, in contrast to yourself. But um, hmm. I had to learn everything from scratch. I, and that took me probably four months of just doing content review, um, not doing really any practice, um, maybe at the end of the end of the chapter questions, but just focusing on content. Now, if a student is weak in content, and I kind of gonna go off of like a, a GPA for this most often, because I wish it wasn't the case, but it is a good indicator. And if someone has a low GPA, I usually recommend um, four to five months of part time or two months of full time studying just for content. And usually that works out to about a chapter a day. Um, and it seems like a long time for content review, but at the, you know, at the end of the day, you're just trying to be successful in the MCAT. You have to do what it takes. Now, of course, if I work with a student who is currently in school and they're going to try and do it in the summer and they're already a chemistry and organic chemistry tutor. So a lot of their content is really strong. Well, then they can probably get through in about three or four weeks. So it really depends on where the, where the student is. But being realistic with yourself for how much time you're going to have to relearn the content is is very important. And it seems like you could kill two birds with one stone there. If you have a low GPA, um, you, you probably want a pretty high MCAT score to kind of balance y- your application out a little bit. So, um, you know, the longer you can spend on it, I guess, the better. I agree. And it's it really is worth it um, to and there's nothing wrong with having a low GPA and, you know, realizing that you didn't actually learn acid based chemistry when you were in a, a freshman. That's totally fine. You just have to be realistic with yourself. And, and all right, well, I have to put in the work. So. Right. And this this might be a, a warning. Like, I hope that I hope there's some students listening right now that are maybe still in school. Um, Because I wish I would have thought this way, but I think I was talking to you at some point about this. Um, But when you're in school, you really need to try to learn the material. You know, I think there's some students that think that they can just kind of get by, get the grade and move on. But that's just not the case. When when you're taking the MCAT, the more you know the content, the better you're going to do. 100%. The most important thing that anybody can do while they're going through school is to do the very best that they can and to learn the material thoroughly, not just get, I'm, I'm a very guilty offender here of just getting the grade moving on and never looking back. And of course that uh, necessitated me having to relearn all the sciences, um, pretty much from, from scratch. Like I couldn't even remember what was part of an atom when I started. Um, it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty dire situation and it just, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to gain all that ground. So the best thing that anybody can do is to do their best, but also something that almost nobody thinks about is in between terms or in, you know, after you've moved on from a class, review that material. And not, not for the sake of the MCAT per se, but uh, to, you know, to kind of fight that Ebbinghaus forgetting curve and and get it, Mm -hmm. get it stronger in your memory. Sure, sure. So going back to study plans a little bit here. um, So we talked a little bit about kind of when you should switch from, you know, just doing content review to practice questions, you know, depending upon um, your, your background and what you know. Uh, what about taking exams? Like at what point should you start taking exams, practice, practice exams? Definitely. And this doesn't have to be a science because everybody has a little bit different of a preference, but this is my advice. Step one, take a diagnostic exam. Don't review it so that it's new whenever you come to take it again. And I recommend the double AMC sample test because now it's free. So take it, just see where you are. Um, you're not going to be happy with your score. Uh, that's okay. And if you don't review it, well, then when you take it, you know, and three or four months later, you're going to be, it's going to be brand new. So I would recommend starting off with that. And after that, I usually encourage my students to not take a test until they're completely done with content review. And the reason why is if you were to go and take a, a practice exam, you know, like a month in, and that's a really common piece of advice that you hear is, oh, just take a test after a month to see how you're doing. 
I mean, first of all, it's going to be t- a terrible score and you're not going to like it. You're still not going to like your score, right. uh, even if it's up a handful of points. But the other reason is, I mean, if there are two passages on electrochemistry and you haven't gotten there yet, what's the point? You're just sort of wasting your time. So um, that's why I encourage don't no practice tests until you're completely done with content. And then, you know, regular spacing, um, probably, of course, depending on everybody's uh, situation, one or two, uh, uh, like non double AMC exams until you kind of get to when you should be doing all the double AMC stuff. And that's for most people about a month or two months out from their actual testing. I know they say nothing is ever free, but this is literally free. Now let me explain. So as a competition for work, I can receive $1 for every lead, which is an email and a name that I generate. And that's up to $500. Now this money is gonna be given to me in the form of an Amazon gift card. However, I know what it's like to be a broke college student trying to study for the MCAT, so I wanna pass this money on to one of you guys. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna raffle off the Amazon gift card I received from the competition. This could be up to $500 if at least 500 people register for the giveaway. But if 10 people register, that's gonna be $10. If 20 people register, that's gonna be $20, and so on and so forth. So if you want to sign up for this giveaway, go to the show notes for this podcast, follow the link, enter your first, last name, and email, and you'll be entered. It's that easy. The deadline to enter is Wednesday, April 14th. So sign up soon. Now, what um, non-double AMC test do you typically recommend to your students? Yes. So I will, full transparency, I am biased because I helped to write these exams, but med school coach, we have <laughs> I just launched our first um our first practice exam, which is going to be followed up by our other two, which are ready to go. Just need to sort of mm-hmm. get those get those out there. But outside of those, awesome. I would recommend, um, I like the blueprint exams. I feel that those are probably the best uh, third-party exams out there. Of course, again, I'm biased. I think ours are the best, um, but th- that's what I would recommend. Gotcha. How, uh, a little aside, how difficult is it to like make an exam I think you know when you're taking it it's not necessarily something you think about would be you know super hard to do but what's that process like is that tough it's really tough to make a representative exam and what I mean by that is something that feels like you're taking a double AMC exam that's really tough to do it's not so hard to make a bunch of passages and questions and whatnot and throw it together and you have 230 MCAT questions great that's not so that's not so tough making a really good representative one and that's something we really really strived for and i think we uh, i'd like to think that we were able to do that gotcha now let's move on to the bane of my existence when i was studying for the mcat cars (laughs) what how do you recommend students study for cars what what i did and I'll, i'll just preface this by saying it didn't really work for me is i was doing just kind of a few passages every day um you know, I would do maybe two or three and then call it good. And I would just do that five days a week. Um, that didn't work for me. What do you recommend? Yes. So uh, I'm going to recommend something I did not do when I was studying, um, which was I just practiced cars as well. Um, but I recommend doing a, a big mix of practice. What I mean is some timed, some untimed. But the biggest thing for cars, and this is over the years, I found the number one predictor if someone's going to improve you can improve quite a bit here is if you review them and we're like oh yeah i re- i review i redo the answers and whatnot but do you write anything down do you find patterns do you find trends because of course the mcat is a standardized exam and so they can't throw something completely different at you and then double amc if you really dug, dig into their cars it's there are a lot of patterns it's not that complicated in terms of the construction of the questions and whatnot. And I'm not saying cars isn't complicated. Don't get me wrong there. But in terms of uh, review, that's the number one thing. Write down the patterns um, and figure out sort of the game that is is being played. Gotcha. I think that's also a pretty important process just for, you know, practice exams in general. Um, now, what, what, do you, what do you tell students to do in terms of reviewing pra- practice exams? Like how much time should they... Uh, take to do that? Um, and what does that process look like? For sure. So something that I do with all of my students, and I'm kind of a stickler, um, but everybody thinks me at the, like, you know, after it's over, is I make them keep a spreadsheet of every 
uh, question that they ever do that's NCAT. So for sciences, if they get it correct and they knew how to solve it and didn't really learn anything from reviewing it, well, there's not really anything to put down. Just pat yourself on the back. Now, of course, if you learn something or if you guessed or, and got it correct and didn't really know like the content or the, the problem solving process for it, that's your opportunity to really dig in and learn something that you won't forget for testing. And that's that's the attitude to have. Every question that you get wrong or thing that you learn, put it in your spreadsheet and make it robust. Like add the content in there for the question that you did. Um, for example, I was working with a student yesterday and we were reviewing her spreadsheet and I uh, very forgivably forgot about SN1 and SN2 reactions. So wrote down that SN2 reactions are good. You want to have a, you know, in po or polar aprotic solvent, but not, but not the why. Like the, why would you want that solvent? And it's that extra deeper layer for content that you can include during your review that will really, really boost your score. It's kind of, yeah, it always kind of mesmerizes me is uh, I'll, I'll work with students who have tried the MCAT a few times and just really have a hard time improving. And then I make them do this review spreadsheet and do a really a good job. And then it's like magic. Their score just sort of starts to improve. It's really cool. Um, but in terms of the, what? Wow. Yeah, in terms of the time that you should be doing uh, a review for a full length, minimum the amount of time it took you to take the test. Okay. Yeah, and I I mean, I'll, I'll second that totally. That was, for me, that was kind of the most important part of my studying was I would, um, you know, take a practice exam on, on a Saturday and then just spend all day Sunday just going through and really trying to pick out kind of what I was missing. And, and um, you know, then then I could focus my studies the next week on you know, reviewing concepts that I didn't know or um, I wasn't very familiar with. I think that's a fantastic way to go about it. And of course, if you're a part-time uh, studier, I know you could take a practice exam on, on Saturday and then spend the entire week reviewing. And as long as you're kind of reviewing other notes and whatnot as you go along, that's a, a fantastic use of, of time if you're a part-time studier. Definitely, definitely. Um, so aside from practice tests, Kind of what third-party materials do you usually tell students to use? Does it does it matter? You know, I think going through like the student doctor network, um, you know, forums and Reddit forums, you see people recommending this book versus that book, or this, you know, this book or this type of um, you know passage book, whatever it may be. What do you usually tell students to use? That's an excellent question. So I will say that. There have been very many successful people who have used on the MCAT that have used every different resource out there. And so if you really dig into a resource, the quality of it isn't real, isn't going to be the reason why you're successful or not successful. Uh, that being said, I like to recommend students use Anki. Um, and mm -hmm. I didn't use it when I studied and I wish I would have. I wish it was kind of around. It wasn't, it wasn't so much a thing in 2015, uh, but I recommend that. And there are some, some pre-made uh, decks out there that you can use. I think you're actually high quality. Of course, if you have the time, making your own note cards is the best. And I also like to recommend uh, UWorld. I think they're a really good resource for, uh, they're every, we all know their explanations are fantastic and really, uh, really help to solidify that content. Other than, other than those two, it really depends if a student needs extra practice exams. Of course, there are free practice exams um, out there that you can, that you can get, but there, that's a lot of questions already in terms of uh, kind of third party resources. And most people can't, don't have the time to get through all of that anyways. So those are my top two recommendations. Gotcha. So, so are you saying that, are you saying that in the end, it comes down to how hard a student is willing to work and basically how much time they're willing to put in kind of yes and i'll qualify the hard part with smart like how smart yeah like how um just the quality right um and so because you could take a you know 50 practice exams uh, that's kind of a lot i think i think i've seen people take like 20 practice exams which seems like a ton but it's not it's not uncommon but they don't improve and they just kind of same thing over and over again. It's like that insanity bit, right? So insanity being something you do the same thing over and over and you expect a different result. Um, so, mm -hmm. but yeah, a lot of it is the time um, and, and, you know, working hard and smart. Gotcha. Now, kind of one of the last questions I have here about, about planning for, for studying is when should a student postpone or cancel their exam? 
I know it's a fairly tough decision that um, you know students have to make. So how do you go about helping them make that decision, and what factors go into making it? Great question. So for a student, um, and I see this as someone who had to push their test back originally when I when I prepared, just wasn't ready. And it's a tough decision. It affects a lot of things in your life, including other people in your life. But it's a mature decision. Um, there, and I think the the metric or the objective. A uh, piece of data that you can use to make that decision is two to three weeks out. If you still have not scored your goal score on an official double AMC exam in realistic conditions, you have no business trying to go and sit for your test. Now, of course, if you're like, oh, I want a 528 and you're not there, but you get some, you have, you have a practice that can score that would get you into medical school. Well, maybe you don't postpone until you're hitting a 528. You just have some more realistic expectations. Um, but yeah, I think it's that three week mark out. If you're not really close to your goal score or have already achieved it, then the smart, mature, prudent thing to do is to push it. Gotcha. That's helpful. Okay. So the, the next thing I want to do here is just what I did is I went through, um, an SDN and Reddit forms, and I kind of pulled out some tidbits of advice that students are giving to, to other students. And I want you to either confirm or deny that advice. Sound good? Sounds great. <laughs> okay, here we go. Some of these are somewhat silly, and then some of them I think are serious. So the very first one is about cars, and it says, quote, I didn't study for cars. Do you, do you recommend that or no? I do not recommend that. Um, and I, the real question is, how do you study for cars? And yeah. it, it is a lot of practice. It's thinking about how you read. Um, but I usually recommend for students to just go online and, and do a little bit of research about how people who are just natural, strong readers read, like what's going on in their brain and then try and do that. Um, I mean, it seems pretty simple, but it's a good place to, good place to start. Um, I will say if you take a diagnostic exam in your cars as a one to 30, you probably don't need to study for cars, but that's like the, the extreme rare exception. How, how often does that happen? Is that just, I'm, I'm, Maybe I'm, um, maybe I'm just kind of stereotyping here, but is that usually like the English majors that are, you know, 132 right out the door or 130? It's, it, it's actually math people in my experience. Oh, interesting. And, um, I had somewhat of a similar experience. Cars felt, feels very much like math to me. Um, and it, it just kind of an analytical thinking way that through all your classes, you're sort of, you're sort of trained for, but outside of that, you know, humanities majors, philosophy majors, um, you know, also people who are just bloody brilliant. <laughs> yep. Um, so this one's also in reference to cars. It says, quote, I practiced honing my concentration by reading long articles that I ran into online, as well as meditating every day. I, there's a lot of wisdom in that, especially the meditating that would be very important, of course, with focus, meditate anytime you see your your mind wandering off during the day, just, you know, practice pulling it back into whatever you're whatever you're doing. Um, I mean, you could be doing something on your phone and you're starting to get distracted. Just practice bringing your, your attention back in. Right. Because a lot of those passages are not the most entertaining pieces of literature that anyone's ever read. Right. Oh, man. 18th century humanism. I, I just I can't. <laughs> I think that might be the only time I've ever actually read about some of these things, though, which is good, right? So maybe it exposes people to concepts and ideas that they wouldn't have otherwise. That's a really good point. I mean, how many times has the concept of, you know, knowledge, true belief and justification come up? And, you know, that's a, a philosophy concept most of us haven't encountered before, but you know, kind of yeah. a theme. Yep. Um, OK, so the next one here is, quote, for the lax for the last month. I was doing a practice test roughly every three days. That seems like a lot to me, but what do you think? That seems like a lot. Now, of course, if, you're, if your stamina is just awful, I still don't think that's probably the best use of your time. You should you know, do section exams or something like that. Um, but I just don't know how someone would, would be able to make improvements in three days. And so that's why I don't think it would be a very good strategy. Right. There's got to be time when you're reviewing that test and then, you know, making sure that you understand concepts that you missed, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Completely. Um, okay, next one here. Quote, third-party full lengths are not representative of your, of your score. Just use, them to stimul just use them to simulate exam condition and gain stamina, end quote. 
again, there's some wisdom here. Um, it kind of goes back to the difficulty of making a truly representative um, uh, practice exam um, so that students taking it really feels like what they'd see on test day. And I like I like this wisdom because most third party exams are their word length in the sciences are close to double the word length in the AAMC exams. I know I've, I've done oh, wow. the, I've done the counting um, and it's <laughs> it just kind of uh, makes for unrealistic practice. But it they are useful, again, for stamina and then also just practicing answering questions and being savvy with your time and managing your time so you can get the most points, you know, decision making, uh, be helping you become more decisive when you're answering the questions. All those are, are good things for that third party exams. do. Yeah. And I think, you know, having that mindset too can be somewhat important. I know when I was taking the exam, there was a few poor scores I got on some next step, um, which is now blueprint full lengths. And it kind of, you know, it didn't necessarily set me back, but it just, you know, I, I, would, I was bummed out about it. And there's nothing to be bummed out about because it's just in, in some ways not quite representative. Yep. But I don't, I bet that, you know, being bummed out and yeah, it takes a hit to your motivation and how well you're able to right. study. And so it's just, yeah. but having the right, having the right attitude um, is definitely key. Okay. Here's the last one. And this one is interesting to me because in some ways, I kind of agree with it, but I want, I'm curious what you think. And, and it's this quote, never even open the organic chemistry review book. Organic, organic chemistry questions are so low yield. Yes. Let's unpack that for a minute. So yeah. yes, organic chemistry is the lowest yield topic on the MCAT. There are roughly 11, anywhere from 10 to 12 organic chemistries on an actual, you know, MCAT, like an actual MCAT. So that you got a point, you got a point there. However, <clears throat> I see organic chemistry pop up in the in biochemical context uh, a little bit in general chemistry, you know, if we're talking about loose acids, bases, and nucleophiles, mm -hmm. and then actually a bit in biology. And so I really stress to my students to get uh, probably about the, you know, 70% of the organic really, really strong. And the 30% that I don't stress so much is some of the the, the truly low yield stuff that, that could potentially come up if you're unlucky, but it'd only be a question or two. So, but things like why nucleophiles act the way they are, um, that's super important. And you're not probably going to be tested directly on that content, but it really builds this intuition about how these biological uh, molecules behave and how, you know, how proteins are, are broken down and things like that. So I, I do think it's really important Again, the lower yield stuff, enolate chemistry, possible you'll see it, probably not. And you can probably still get the question correct, even if you don't know it. So those are, that's what I would say about organic chemistry is learn it, make it intuitive because it's going to pay dividends in other sections. Sure. And one thing that I just always thought was kind of interesting is, you know, when you're going through OCHEM class, really the bulk of the work is kind of like learning these different mechanisms, um, learning, you know, how molecules are going to react. And that's somewhat on the MCAT, but there's not a whole lot of mechanistic stuff on there, is there? There's not. There's not. There's really not much that is explicitly tested on there. Of course, you hear, you know, tales from people who have taken actual MCATs and they're like, oh, I had to know this, that, or the other thing that I've never seen since organic right. chemistry. Oh, I'm lucky that I knew it. But I would, you know, I wasn't there with them for their test, but I would argue that they probably could have gotten the questions correct without knowing what these mechanisms were, just by, again, having a good chemical intuition of how atoms and molecules behave and, you know, being able to count carbons. That's something that you can usually do. Yes. A lot of carbon, a lot of carbon counting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's, that's all I have for you. And uh, I, I really appreciate your time and, and, you, you taking the time to talk to me about this. Yeah, absolutely. It was my pleasure. Hope to, hope to talk to you soon. Yep, yep. All right, I'll talk to you later. Sounds good. All right, bye. Each episode of MCAT Basics is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including MCAT tutoring and medical school admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for the MCAT, and we hope you tune in again next time.